Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Breaking Changes podcast. I'm your host and chief evangelist for Postman, Ken Lane. With Breaking Changes, we are exploring the world of APIs through the lens of business and engineering leadership. Joining me today, we have Namdi Iregbilum, partner at Lightspeed Venture Partner. Namdi has his finger on the pulse of what's happening when it comes to data and real-time infrastructure. And he shared with me a little bit about how he got here, but also a glimpse at what is hot from an investor point of view. Let's just dive right in. Who are you and, and, and what do you do? Awesome. Well, th thanks so much for inviting me to do this. Uh, my name is Namdi Reikbalam. I'm a partner at Lightspeed Venture Partners, uh, which is a long-running venture capital firm where I focus on early stage software investments in all things technical. So uh, developer tools, application infrastructure, data science, machine learning, you know, basically anything that serves a more technical audience, you know, primarily developers and data scientists. Um, I have personally been a self-taught programmer for a long time, so it's really fun to put my money where my mouth is. Yeah, yeah. So why why investment over over programming? What what made you go down this road? Yeah, it's it's, it's a good question. Um, so I, in, as a backstory, I'm the firstborn son of two Nigerian immigrants who really wanted me to be a doctor someday. And in some ways, my initial forays into programming were trying to find some other thing that I could do and um, fell in love with it, tinkering with you know, programs, modifying, uh, you know, building websites and whatnot, modifying games that I was playing, building computers and whatnot. And it became pretty obvious to me that this was the route that I wanted to go. Um, but, you know, the other kind of residue of having uh, sort of immigrant parents is that you, there's sort of the sense that you, you are what you study. And I wasn't sure I wanted to be a software developer. And so I didn't want to major in engineering. Um, and what I did find uh, as a great sort of study area was economics. Um, I saw what was going on over there and all the different positive and negative effects that finance can have on the world. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And so um, decided to, to study that. And I've been kind of on that route for the most part of space, but always with a focus on the technical tools and the technology generally. Yeah. Very interesting. I like your, I, I would say like investment is not a route I would have gone, but I, I, in my career, but I really appreciate technical folks making that choosing to go because it really showed in our, in our brainstorming conversation, like the, the, the depth that you had from other investor conversations I've had, you, you, mm -hmm. you definitely have your finger on a pulse of, of, of what's going on. And for me, I'm in the API space. I come from a database and technical background. Uh, so I come from the technical part, but I quickly saw that there was more to all of this than, uh, than just the technology that the business of, of APIs really mattered, uh, doing APIs as a product. Um, but the politics and, and, uh, regulation, investor, there's a lot more to it that makes a, a product, a company successful or a technology or a platform successful. And, and then I would say as I well, work at Postman, chief evangelist at Postman, and we're a dev tool company. So you kind of opened the door there with dev tools, but you rapidly went into some other pretty advanced areas. So let's start with dev tools. What's, What's why do dev tools matter in 2022 when it comes to investment? Has it all been done or is there interesting things happening right now? Uh, it definitely hasn't all been done. And there's almost too many interesting things happening these days. But from like a first principle standpoint, um, the reason I care so much about developer tools is because I care so much about uh, developer productivity. Um, I think that productivity in a sort of modern Kind of knowledge-based economy is the way that uh, the typical person kind of um, advances themselves, you know, earns higher wages over time, contributes more um, to society over time. And so anything that can help enhance the productivity of the average kind of knowledge worker is really interesting to me. And it's especially interesting to me in the context of software development because there's always these shiny new tools uh, basically every day, if not every hour coming out and, you know, oftentimes, you know, it's all really interesting, but sometimes productivity is sort of an afterthought and it's not always obvious that this new thing is actually, uh, you know, moving the ball forward from a productivity standpoint. And so I kind of try to use it as a sort of important lens in everything that I do. 
I also think it's important from the perspective of um, if I want more and more uh, people to be able to become software developers and want more and more, I want that talent pool to grow over time. You know, if, I, if for companies to employ more engineers over time, they need to see the sort of gains from that, the ROI, and that comes mainly in the form of productivity. Um, and so if I can help people ship more software faster, then there'll be more people who can become engineers, more companies will want to hire those folks. And it just kind of creates this really nice kind of flywheel effect almost in the, in the ecosystem. And so uh, developer tools are kind of at the core of that. Um, you know, I've been a big investor in the category for a while. And, you know, probably my, my claim to fame would be sort of investing in GitLab, but um, which you went public recently. Um, but, you know, always trying to find the next one too. Uh, but don't tell Sid that. <laughs> yeah, GitLab was made a pretty big splash. I would say I didn't I didn't really see it in the I would say in the shadow of GitHub at the moment because I was kind of captivated by what GitHub did with uh uh Git and making Git more social and more uh, uh modernize it. But GitLab I would say really surpassed in my mind as far as actually that hitting on the productivity piece that you talked about. It wasn't just about public repos and and public open source solutions it really i think hit on what enterprises need and and are really actually needing to enable that that productivity and not just from a top down but from a bottom up too like actually making developers happy in their day and successful and that's what i heard in your your definition of productivity is it's not just productivity for the sake of business productivity it's productivity so developers are happier healthier there's a wider pipeline of pool of people striving to do things. So, so I like that. I, I support that. So I, I, I'll, I'd love to help, you know, keep sharing notes as far as dev tools out there that I think is the next GitLab. Um, but I don't have any Thank off you. the top of my, <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so let's, let's rattle through some of the areas, I guess. So service mesh has been one um, area that, investors have been talking about for a while as being the next thing. And there's definitely some things there, but as far as um, at the, I'm really interested at the gateway layer and what, what are you seeing next when it comes to um, proxies and gateways, ingress, egress, like what enterprises are needing? Cause this is the API layer for me. So is it, is it real time infrastructure? Is it, is it more service mesh and that circuit breaker type stuff? Is it what are you seeing at at that dimension that's that's moving and shaking things? Yeah, there's a couple of different things I could talk about. Um, you know, one of my favorites is something you mentioned, which is around kind of real time infrastructure and the shift from uh, let's call it kind of batch paradigms of old, where you had a you know, database or a data warehouse of some sort, it would be updated. On a more infrequent basis, you know, maybe once a day or even, you know, once in a longer time period. And so whenever you sort of query that database, you would have basically stale data at any particular moment, unless you were just so lucky as to query it right after the updates. And, um, and as a result, it, uh, uh, your businesses weren't able to sort of adapt in real time to data as it's changing you know, in their business. Um, and so execs and, and whoever else cares about that data can only see what's recent, uh, you know, a week ago uh, of information or two days ago or what have you, and things could be out of date by then or, or irrelevant uh, uh, at worst. And so, um, but shifting from real time to a sort of higher frequency of data output uh, requires a bunch of sort of changes in the underlying architectures. It's not as simple as just turning a knob. and so. There's been sort of this emerging category of uh, technologies that help support this. And I've been lucky enough to be an investor in a, in a few of them. You know, there's sort of the whole streaming ecosystem, uh, which, you know, Confluent has done a great job evangelizing, you know, via Kafka. You know, I'm an investor in a company called uh, Red Panda, which is sort of a next-gen take on, on, on streaming data with a sort of built-from-scratch uh, streaming engine built in C++, which is you know, highly performant. and also, Kafka API compatible, so actually fairly easy to use. Another example is a company like um, Materialize, which is basically, let's say you have a stream of data coming in, and you want to basically create a materialized view of that data that's constantly updating as the data is coming in and, and changing. That's actually technically quite difficult to do, but the, the team there uh, built this technology called Timely Data Flow, 
um, that's actually able to do what you kind of call change data capture as data is coming in, uh, update the database in real time, and able you to basically query at very low latencies and get very fresh data, which is like the classic trade-off that you typically face in most systems. It's either, either you get low latency or you get really fresh data. Historically, it's been very hard to get both. Um, and so Materialize is helping kind of break that paradigm. Um, we're also investors in a company called ClickHouse, just doing stuff around real-time uh, OLAP, uh, you know, analytical processing, um, and a couple of things that are coming down the pipe soon that I can't talk about yet. But um, really just a big fan of real-time real data infrastructure, and I think now it's its moment. Uh, so that's, that's one uh, piece that I think is really interesting. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting um, for folks who might be on the line who are, are involved in running sort of cloud uh, hosted managed offerings for um, e various infrastructure solutions is this idea of peering uh, from uh, the, the, the on-prem to the cloud. And on-prem can be defined as not necessarily literally on-prem, but the self-managed or what have you, to some kind of managed offering. And we're, we're increasingly entering a, a world where uh, hybrid hybrid cloud is kind of the the rest the the sort of steady state scenario where you have some stuff that you're managing yourself and then you have some stuff that's being managed by some vendor in the cloud. And how do you get these systems to talk to each other in a secure way? Oftentimes, with you know, potentially with traffic going over the public internet, which is a big uh, you know red flag for a lot of CISOs and security focused uh, folks, and so. There's sort of an emerging set of different tools and technologies that one can use to kind of build that bridge. And so you could have uh, a one for like an open source version of some infrastructure technology like Red Panda or like Elastic or you know, take your pick, run it in your own virtual private cloud, also have that connect to the managed service running from the vendor itself. So like Elastic Cloud or like Red Panda Cloud or what have you. Um, and do that in a way that doesn't raise any kind of red flags or security issues. Uh, I think that's really interesting. I think that's going to be increasingly a paradigm for these these kind of data infrastructure vendors. Um, so that's like another thing that I'm, I'm very closely tracking. Yeah, it really sounds like, I mean, this is REST APIs or simple web APIs has been kind of it, scratching away at the, the, the legacy database infrastructure. And I would say the the gateway has, it's got a long ways to go, but it's starting to shift the power center from the classic database, which is the world I come from, 80s and 90s database is the power center of any enterprise and organization. And those guys can uh, write their own ticket. They have jobs forever. They have a lot of power and control. But the gateway has started kind of pulling that away. But this real-time shift, um, and I agree what I'm seeing as well and, and event driven laying on there is, is how do we make it more real time? How do we map it to our, our real world needs when it comes to, well, we have these existing legacy databases. We have some things that are on prem, some things that are in the cloud or in managed services. How do we map to that? But then how do we make it as, as, uh, not just request and response. So synchronous, but asynchronous so that we can get notified when, when events change. We have dashboards that are always up to date. And so uh, and and so what are you seeing at this layer when it comes to data science or data ops? You, you know, you, you talked about dev tools and empowering uh, developers as part of the microservices evolution and this kind of shift to the gateway power. You know, DevOps, too, is developers have a lot of power now. They have a lot of they're really important to a lot of operations. So when it comes to. Data science, data ops, what are you seeing there? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, there is uh, a number of different paradigms in software development that people have tried to varying degrees of success apply to the kind of data ecosystem and, and, and data science. You know, the notion of DevOps, you know, agile development, uh, you know, get-based workflows, you know, et cetera. Um, and so there's sort of this emerging set of tools that you could call either you know, ML ops on um, this kind of machine learning specific uh, area, and then this sort of modern data stack, which centers around typically a cloud data warehouse, the source of truth for data in your organization, and then a bunch of different tools that kind of either feed into that or feed off of that. Um, as I mentioned, like 
Some software development paradigms transfer over well, some don't. Um, and what's interesting is that, especially in the data science world, these skill sets that make you a great software engineer are not perfectly overlapping with the skill sets that make you a good data scientist. And oftentimes, folks who are brilliant data scientists are just terrible at <laughs> uh, traditional software development and have never shipped anything to production. And so there's sort of this very natural friction point that occurs when, okay, if you have a machine learning project of some sort, some data science thing, it kind of works in in uh, the prototyping phase and you can kind of test it and it, it looks, looks okay. But then when you want to put it in production and you have to do all the things that kind of harden it um, to do that, it's like a real barrier for many organizations. It's sort of a, it's, you know, there's that phrase like crossing the chasm. There's sort of a crossing the chasm when it comes to, to data science. And, um, and so I think I, I continue to think that's kind of a big gap in most organizations. And I spent a lot of time looking at um, different tools to help people kind of bridge that gap. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things happening around the modern data stack. Um, you know, I mentioned, you know, folks like Snowflake, uh, you know, Redshift, BigQuery, you know, these cloud data warehouses that are extremely sort of cloud native. You have folks like Fivetran that can kind of feed data into those data warehouses. And then folks like EBT or Matillion can kind of extract data out. Um, or I should say transform the data in the data warehouse, which is an important uh, kind of element. Um, I'm really excited by this ecosystem. It's sort of been this real big shift in just the past few years. Like, Five years ago, I don't think I had heard of DBT, and now it's like you can't avoid hearing about it. Um, you know, um, I've been following the Snowflake story for longer, but still, it's really been a shift over just the past few years, and so it's it's all really exciting. Um, and I'm curious to see kind of where it settles in terms of paradigms that work for data um, and data science, how much those end up being similar to or different than the programs that work for modern software development. Yeah, the I would say the pool of data scientists is going to be talk about increasing the pipeline of developers. Like, it's not easy to produce data scientists. So do you, do you no. see tooling and startups as being how we're going to augment them with exoskeletons to be, you know, have the superpowers they need or, or maybe, uh, you know, data ops or DevOps people to have more data scientist-like skills? Is that possible through this tooling? I think it is, um, um, it's especially if you take some of the ML and data science tooling and integrate it really nicely with this sort of modern data stack. Um, there are a number of folks who are attempting to do this. Um, you know, there's a company called Continual that's basically trying to create sort of very much a modern data stack native approach to ML. It makes it quite easy to um, uh, for even a non, even a less technical person, just like a data analyst who works with data but maybe doesn't know how to write code and isn't that kind of person to connect to your data warehouse, train and, and deploy uh, state of the art, either machine learning model, and then feed those uh, predictions back to the data warehouse as like a source of truth. Um, I think that's really interesting and could be the sort of right form factor to, to help solve this, uh, which was basically a labor supply shor shortage um, in this in this ecosystem. Um, and you know, if, if and there's there's more there's more there's a whole long list of different things that are being worked on in this area, but um, I think it's all really interesting and. Um, and you might, and I think you might be right that there's potentially more of a labor supply shortage in data science than there even is in software engineering, which is saying a lot. I would say the this doesn't sound like our grandfather's AI or ML. It's not. It, it doesn't feel like it's Watson anymore. You know, the omniscient one. You train. You just give all your data to this one. You know, omniscient, pre, you know, godlike presence. It knows everything, and you ask its questions. This type of machine learning seems much more granular, atomic. And is that what ML, what, what is ML ops and model ops? I keep hearing about how this is supposed to be enabling this realm. What, what are those? Yeah, it, it, it's sort of like treating your machine learning models, you know, very similar to the way you would treat maybe not a, a application, but a sort of microservice almost is kind of one way of thinking about it. 
and think about these more kind of like, as you were putting it, like atomic uh, uh, ML models that are really just at the end of the day functions, like a model takes in an input and shoots out an output. And so you think about that just like a function, then you can run it just like any other function. You can write it like microservice, you can run it like a serverless function of some sort. Um, and so the sort of set of tooling that kind of has emerged for kind of how do you manage all of that and um, and and wrangle all of that. It, any organization is going to have a bunch of different models running at the same time. It's not like one master model, as you were, as you were saying. And so um, it, it almost ends up being like a, like you have a microservices fleet in software development. You have a sort of model fleet in, in ML. Um, and so it, it requires some sort of tooling to just to rationalize it. Um, so I think, I think that stuff is really interesting. Um, there's so many vendors in the space, we'll know which is going to actually create a lot of value. Um, it's like you look at these ML ops landscapes and there's a million and one logos on there, but um, I'm glad folks are working on it. Yeah, I'm always curious. It's it's tough to keep up with the startups and understanding what's what's actually making people's lives on the ground floor. But it, it sounds like, this machine learning's got to be much more real time that those models, like whatever the, the solution we choose, our models have to iterate and evolve along with this real time data as well. We can't just be constantly training and, and, and doing that work. It's got to get automated or are there, are there like get flows for machine learning or how, how is this managed? Yeah, it depends a little bit on what um, sort of approach you take from a modeling standpoint. But as a general rule, these models can be framed in terms of code that you could put in a Git repository or in terms of sort of a data set that you can sort of store like anything else. Um, and so that's that's the approach that folks uh, typically take. And then to your point around um, for like version control and whatnot, and then to your point around, um, you know, real time email, can't talk about it yet, but have some stuff coming down the pipe in this area that um, you kind of hit the nail on the head um, is, as things are moving real time. Uh, a lot of ML models are actually not meant to be operated in real time. They have to be kind of modified in a certain way. And that's its own skill set. You have the ingest data, output predictions has to be kind of modified. And so um, that's a, a very kind of underserved category today, but a very fast growing one in terms of uh, needs um, from, from, from businesses. And so, um, Excited to support that category and more more to come yeah. in, in the near future. Yeah, I look forward to that because I, I, I could see testing emerging. Like you've got to test these models because I've seen, you know, modern ML be compared to uh, puppies and kittens. You know, it's like you, you, it grows and it changes and like sometimes get get all Frankenstein on you. You know, even at a, a small yeah. granular level. So you got to be testing. Well, wait, that that batch. That of real time data did something to the kitten that you know we're not we're not right. co you know cool with so um so so when it comes to this real time infrastructure is this the the customers who are buying these services are these large enterprises are they is it scope of operations that drives people to this because I'm getting a lot of questions from API people who had the last five years of microservices and and they, they've dabbled in GraphQL now. They, they've got REST APIs. They're building them as products. But they're like asking me, you know, what's next? What should we be investing in? And what's that trigger for? Is it, is it size of data, scope of data, you know, demand and volume of requests? What, what drives that real-time growth when it comes to the enterprise? Yeah, I think there's um, maybe two or kind of emerging um, constituents um, interested in kind of real-time uh, infrastructure. Uh, one are folks who have um, an extremely high frequency or cardinality of data. These are typically folks in the consumer arena where you have hundreds of thousands or millions of customers and those customers are interacting with your product, which generates a bunch of real-time like click stream data. Um, your product is oftentimes making recommendations to those folks which need to be generated in real time based off their past behavior and whatnot. There are various ways you can kind of in real time um, sort of prompt the user in ways that might increase conversion rates or increase how much they order from other e-commerce sites or what have you. And so this sort of this sort of set of 
whether it's e-commerce, marketplace businesses, various consumer apps, what have you, they just have a natural tendency to like to operate in real time if possible. And they've always been pushing the edge in terms of data infrastructure just due to the sheer volume of data that they generate. And so that's gonna be one category that I've I've seen emerging. And then another constituency is basically large, maybe older enterprises that are doing various things around digital transformation. And one of those um, uh, kind of pillars under that is like, how can we move faster? Like, how can we not be this lumbering giant that sees a problem and then uh, five, six months later is able to react to it or even longer? How do we react and, and, and become more nimble um, in, in, a, in a sort of shorter cadence and kind of decrease decision making and cycle times? Um, and so real time data is a kind of way to do that where you can almost create these applications that on their own kind of react to data as it's changing. And so you need these kind of systems to, to support that. Um, there's, there are other folks who are going to come up in this space as, as needing this kind of technology, but those are probably the ones that I've seen kind of most commonly so far. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always curious, uh, the companies who, who come to me asking these questions and then where they're at in their overall journey. It matters a lot, um, where they're coming from, how they're, how they're seeing things and how heavy, heavy they're putting their foot on the gas pedal. Uh, what are you seeing when it comes to observability and at these layers? Because that's a big one I know folks are struggling with is just the massive growth in data and, and, and real time activities, being able to observe and, and, and not just understand what's happening and see it in a dashboard, but be able to respond to it. And, and, you know, hearing the real time nature that the urgencies there, what are you seeing from an observability vantage point? Yeah. Um, so I, observability is just such a massive market and no matter how you look at it, where you look at sort of application observability, data observability, uh, you know, model, mo you know, ML model observability is emerging as its own kind of category. Um, similarly, when you have just very large data sets, whether it's log data, metrics data, what have you, or data that has very kind of high cardinality or complexity, you end up, um, needing sort of pretty sophisticated as a ability to link just to understand what's going on and that's filter down to what matters amongst all the things going on. There's so much noise for every unit of signal. Um, there's so many things that can kind of go wrong in these, these complex systems. And so um, there's a bunch of different tooling that's emerged around this. You know, we're invested in a company called Grafana, which is doing some interesting uh, things in this area, to put it mildly. Um, we're invested in another company called Polar Signals, which is a uh, what's called kind of continuous profiling, which is leveraging some of the interesting things happening in the Linux kernel uh, via eBPF to kind of better analyze what's going on uh, from a performance standpoint. And then there is this sort of emerging set of data observability tools, you can call them, that are also benefiting from this shift to the, the, the modern data stack. And um, those are actually quite quite interesting. Yeah, I could, I could, I could go on, but it really is a, is, a, is a big market. There's lots of things to track down. And the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, it's, it's a new market in the sense that there were, there have always been sort of tools for trying to figure out what's going on in your infrastructure, um, you know, in the security space and in just the general log storage space, like Splunk has been a player for a long time, um, but it's also kind of quite expensive and folks are looking for alternative options at this point. And so, um, things that can provide the same level of functionality at a cheaper price, oftentimes, you know, via open source or, you know, gaining a lot of steam these days. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I'm just always fascinated by how we see all of this because it's so massive. And I, I have access to a lot of data just from, we have 18 million developers with Postman and trying to see that and understand and see it in ways that, that matter and then see the health and state of things, um, not just the data that's being generated, but how well things are, are performing and in and, and, and what direction we're moving. All of that is just, it's really hard and it's, it's perpetual too. It's not like, oh, now we can see everything and we're good to go. It's that changes next week, you know, and we're having to do things. Um. From your vantage point, do you have any views into regulatory influence at any of your your startups or investments? Is it got you know European regulation or U.S. regulation playing a role in in what you're seeing? Yeah, I think um, 
I think right now the big focus is around privacy and whether it's you know GDPR of Europe or CCPA in California, which even if you aren't based in California, you end up kind of needing to adapt to. Um, is this kind of sets the standard for much much of the country? Um, you know, teams have to be very sort of careful um, around you know not. Uh, sort of breaking any of these laws as you build your super duper awesome you know, data infrastructure uh, technology. Um, and there's a, a, an emerging set of technologies that are trying to make the, the sort of anonymization of data, removing of personally identifiable information from data, make that process you know, easier and easier. Um, these tools have existed historically, but they've been a little bit of a science project in terms of just their complexity and how you deploy this thing and what is it actually doing. And, and, and then from a data quality standpoint, when you privatize this data, it oftentimes reduce the data quality to the point of being kind of useless. And so kind of how do you balance the quality of data with the, the privacy demands that the regulators are throwing at you? Um, I think it's an important question that's still being kind of worked out in real time, I would say. But that's the main regulatory angle. The only other one that I keep that I would I would keep a close tab on for now is um it, it's I think it really has a, a term associated with it, but it's basically this idea that if you get hacked, you're liable, and so you don't get hacked. And um, in, increasingly, I think we're we're seeing that there's no way to actually prevent a hack in the the long run. Like eventually, your systems will be breached. There's too many holes. The attack surface is too large to avoid that. And so how can you be sort of most resilient to it, conditional on it probably happening? Um, and so how do you reduce the scope of data that a breacher or attacker might get access to if they do manage to get in? Um, how do you reduce the damage that they're able to do? Um, how do you prevent them from, you know, these ransomware attacks that people are doing where they get into your data set and then lock it down and take you hostage, basically? Like, how do you avoid these really bad kind of tail risk scenarios? Um, I think it's an increasing area of focus. And again, I don't know if it, there's like a regulation in particular that will come down around this, but it, there's sort of massive kind of legal liability for companies, I think. And so this is like what you want to avoid if you're a CISO or CIO, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, I spent last night reading a cybersecurity uh, from the cybersecurity agency in, in the U.S. and talking about the cost of a data breach and how they figure it out. But basically it comes down to uh, scope, as you said, the, the number of records, the type of mm -hmm. record. Is it PCI payment information? Is it personal information or is it health information? Because health is the number yeah. one because of PHI. And then um, how long until things got back to normal? So how many days did you sit on this before you knew it? before you responded. And th those were the, the main dimensions at the cost. You know, there was like sliders that you could go, okay, uh, we, we waited six months and it was PHI. Oh, it cost you millions, you know? And so um, it's an interesting realm. And I, I think, I don't know of any uh, regulation, but I think th the teeth are, get, are getting put on. I think a lot, of, a lot of breaches, companies were able to, ah, cost of doing business. We, we shelled out some money. It, it, it hit us in the press. It wasn't too hard, but I think the, 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 the damage is getting greater, but also the teeth on regulation. I think we're going to see a lot more of that coming. So it makes, uh, it, 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 it'll happen. It's just a matter of when and, and at what scope regionally, countrywide, statewide, that kind of thing. But it's like you said with CCPA, California can set the, set the bar, set the tone. Europe can set the bar, set the tone. So uh, we just got to pay attention to these things um, yeah. from the from the investment side. This I'm, I'm always learning and I'm trying to understand the investment side. So you you uh, invest in early stage through like B and C rounds. Is that because like financially that's the sweet spot or and or because you have more control over the direction and helping make them more successful? Why, why is that the sweet spot for, for what you guys have chosen to invest? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. I've been on a little bit of a journey on this point myself. Actually, when I started off as an investor, I was more of a, what's called a growth stage investor. So I was, yeah, mostly in the series C and later. And uh, since joining Lightspeed, I've been more focused on the early stage, as you said, kind of seed stage through series C. 
um, or even Series B. And um, I think both stages are interesting in their own right. Um, what I find fascinating about uh, the early stage is that um, there's just so many, the, 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 the sort of vector that shoots outwards could take many different paths from that point. And um, being able to have an influence on that, being able to go on that journey with the founder um, is really exciting to me. I've always been a bit of a product and technical nerd. And so um, at the earliest stages is when there's still real product and technical risk and being able to understand that as an investor uh, can really pay off. Um, and so I find that, you know, super rewarding. I can, I can be nerding out about this stuff, whether or not I was involved in investing in it, but now I can do that and it's part of the job. So that's always great. Um, and like, you know, being able to go on these journeys with founders, as I mentioned, is just, it's a really special thing. You get to see them evolve. You get to see the, 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 the company evolve. Um, you know, it's a, it's kind of a blessing to do that without having to frankly have much personal risk yourself, which is always kind of a weird dynamic, um, I think, in Silicon Valley between VCs and founders, which is probably a longer discussion. But, um, but that's what I really like about the early stage. You need to have an opinion. You need to have a viewpoint. You need to have a perspective. And um, I'm an opinionated person and like making bets on really technically brilliant people building awesome technical products. So it's it's been a good, good, good match. Yeah, I'm really, I mean, I'm a developer and I've built, I would say about 14, 15 startups. I've only had one that was successful. I'm working on, uh, you know, Postman, I'm not a founder in, but uh, uh, definitely invested in, in it being successful. But early on, I, I'm just fascinated over the last decade what I've learned about investing that I didn't know, um, just how nuanced uh, and how how much it's needed for successful products and services to get out there in front of people. So um, I'm interested in, I, I like your approach. I like your style to it. And um, where, what you guys are focusing on, definitely technically it, it caught my attention, but uh, the fact that you're investing at this kind of front line of, of the API realm and, and data for me being the, the backbone or the blood supply and all of that is, is really interesting. Um, what, what do you do beyond investing in tech? What do you do to, to keep yourself an interesting person, happy, well-adjusted individual? Yeah. Um, so there's some things that are closer to, the stuff I do at work and there's some things that are further in terms of closer, um, you know, I'm a big nerd, both in and out of work. And so, uh, you know, I made, mentioned I majored in economics in undergrad, um, still read a ton of economics. I actually read, I've actually learned more about economics since, uh, graduating than, than I did actually in, in college. So I read probably two or three kind of academics, uh, economic papers each week. And I just find them really fascinating. Um, and the analysis is actually very analogous to what people do in the machine learning world. And so I've actually, there's a lot of like cross pollination and interesting concepts that apply in both areas. So that's been, that's been really awesome. And then, um, and some computer science papers as well, especially in the machine learning area. And then more further away, um, I'm actually a really big dancer. Dancing is like my favorite thing to do. I've also been mostly self taught, um, there and, um, you know, ever since I was a kid, I remember uh, I played football in high school, and I remember my favorite game each year would be the homecoming game. And I would just cross my fingers at the game uh, before the game starts that I don't that I wouldn't get injured so that I could dance at the homecoming dance that night, <laughs> uh, which were always my favorite my favorite things. Um, in college, I did ballroom dancing. Uh, my my freshman year roommate was really into it and got got me into it, and it was one of the more amazing experiences I had. Um, and I you know I've kept up with dancing since, and so. Uh, that's that's my favorite thing to do. Something some surprises people, <laughs> even how I spend my time otherwise. But um, but it's it's awesome. No, it's whatever you got to do to nourish your soul. And I I feel in the tech space you've got to you got to really invest in in those things. And and I would say dancing is always associated with for me with with live music. And I used I used to have record labels and tour companies in the nineteen nineties because I was good at building databases to support their, their operations. And so being at live shows, like behind the mixing board, usually backstage or something, I, you know, I started dancing and doing, you know, I really found it was uh, enjoyable. And it's something I think ha that has disappeared from my life that I should probably bring back because I, I feel like I don't have anything like that, you know, and that's not tech and something that's just so 
you know, about your body and, 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 and being there and being present. So I like it. Yeah. Um, well, um, I mean, I really appreciate your time today. This has been a, a great conversation. Interested to learn from you and the, the real time infrastructure, I think is, is a big part of what I'm trying to educate and understand right now. So you really helped me there. Um, part of my team is the async API team and they're really focused on, uh, defining event driven APIs and that realm. So, uh, I learned a lot. Um, I, I got to dive more into the, the, the data science and the ML ops part of it. Um, observability, traceability, these are all things that are on my list to learn from. So, uh, got you in my Rolodex. I would love to have you back. I think we can maybe explore some other, uh, possibilities down the road, but, uh, until then, I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. This is great. Really appreciate it. Thanks again to Namdi for stopping by. For more on Namdi, you can find him on Twitter as who is Namdi and who is Namdi.com. You can subscribe to the Breaking Changes podcast at postman.com slash events slash breaking dash changes. I'm your host, Ken Lane, and until next time, cheers.